from Daylight Interactive, this is Stories for You. I'm your host, Kazuki Akiba. This is a show where I talk with different individuals, ranging from artists to entrepreneurs, about their journey of where they began and where they are now. So, it's good to see you, man. Yeah, it's good to see you. Uh, last time was uh, when I was, uh, what was it? Talk, we were talking, I was at your panel, actually, your uh, feature film panel. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm actually thinking back to then, and that's how, that's how I know it must have been 2017, because I remember meeting a couple other people at that panel, too, uh, one of which I really kept in touch with, and, and she ended up moving out here to L.A. as well. Um, and uh, it's just been kind of cool to, like, keep keep uh, tabs on the people I met at that actual panel to see where they've gone and stuff. So, yeah. My guest today, joining from L.A., is someone who I'm excited to introduce, Mark Ching, award-winning content creator current vice president of content at The Specialist and former executive of Nickelodeon. Mark is a force in the technology and media world. He has 20 years of experience in the industry and spent 13 years at Viacom's Nickelodeon network, including his time as VP and GM of Noggin, Nickelodeon's direct-to-consumer platform. His work on Nickelodeon games even helped his department win an Emmy. He has made films all his life, and his work has won many awards for Best Science Fiction and Best Special Effects. I met Mark back at his panel for the making of Ghost Store Zero during my tenure at Viacom. He was explaining to those attending about having a side hustle and a creative journey of working on something outside of your usual 9 to 5. I had a lot of questions about it at the time, so we ended up talking to each other for a while. A few years later, through mutual colleagues and friends while working on this podcast, I reached out to him. I wanted to talk to Mark because I thought he might have an advice for me on my side hustle passions, and the most pressing of questions, how do we at Daylight make our core products, hits that resonates with the masses? We talk about all of this in our conversation, and we began back at the beginning of his life on his upbringings and how that ultimately led to his career choices to what he's doing today. Oh, and I should warn you, there's some strong language as well as some background noises as Mark brought his wonderful and energetic sons to the studio in this episode. All right. Here's my conversation with Mark Chang. I really want to dive into what we call our hometown, or uh, in Japanese, it's a uh, furusato. And uh-huh. can, so, can you tell me about your background and where you call home, and what was your like upbringing like during that time? Sure. So, um, I was born in Singapore. Uh, I don't have much memory of it um, uh, at all because we, uh, my family, um, moved out to, uh, to to the U.S. when I was about 18 months old. And so, uh, like I said before, I spent most of my, my entire life really g- growing up on the East Coast. You know, we moved around a little bit from like Massachusetts, spent some time in Greenwich Village, New York. But I really call, uh, I really think of New Jersey as my home or uh, the home of my, my childhood experience and my formative years. Um, I mm-hmm. went to uh, Cornell University in upstate New York. Um, but uh, and after that, kind of lived in, in Queens, New York for a little while, but ended up moving back to uh, New Jersey with my wife and where we got married and, and started a family there. So a lot of when we talk about home or the olden days was about New Jersey and East Coast. While you were uh, growing up, uh, you were really interested in, in movies. So how did you get into movies and what would you say was a pivotal moment that got you involved in the world of uh, content creation? Okay. Uh so w- w- when I look back, I, I wasn't aware of this at all at the time because I was so young. Mm-hmm. But when I, when I look back at my childhood, I felt like I crossed over from what I call just a pure consumer of media to, in my own little way, a creator of media when I was probably around uh, in sixth or seventh grade. And that was when my, my father bought a, a VHS camcorder. And what we ended up doing, just you know, playing around with it one day, was uh, we started to make our own kung fu movies in the backyard. So I remember I'd invite my friends over, like Paul and Alex and a whole bunch of other guys, and we'd get dressed up in like ninja costumes, and we would just you know film with this like gigantic shoulder-mounted camcorder, you know, took like big VHS tapes and film in the backyard like different kung fu fights, you know. And we just had we just had such a good time filming that stuff and then you know running into the house after a couple hours and popping into the vhs and, and player and, and watching it mm-hmm. and I, and i look back at, at those events as being like really pivotal you know in 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 that like we were actually making stuff and watching it and not simply just watching stuff you know and it's also this realization that once you start making at least visual content like that that you're like oh you know like 
a TV show or a, or a movie is, is simply the result of, you know, several camera shots edited together to achieve, you know, a story or a plot point. Um, and uh, as, as, as you start to just make content yourself, you just begin to be aware of the role of all those elements in a, in a story or in like a, a polished, you know, production. Whether it's sound effects, I remember we would make our own sound effects with our mouths off screen of like swords going by or people getting hit with darts in the neck, you know, uh, explosion noises. We'd like put a cassette tape in a radio and like play it off screen and it would become our soundtrack. Just like, and, and those are the small little things you become aware are all elements in a multimedia production that we would watch today on Netflix. What led you to study at Cornell and how did that lead into web development instead of uh, creating content? Yeah, sure. So, so, the, so the quick story is that, um, you know, sixth and seventh grade was one thing playing with the VHS camcorder. It was just like fun times, you know, it was in my head, not a career thing at all uh, until until college, when I realized that there was actually um, a theater department that had a film production um, program. And I was like, oh, wow, like, I think I'm actually going to try that because that's, that's not something like I really, really enjoy um, and wanted to try it out. And so mm-hmm. I was a film. I was a film student at uh, at Cornell. They had a pretty small program comparatively to what you would think like an NYU or a UCLA program would have. Um, and the one thing that I thought was really interesting about their program was that the professor was a really interesting guy, the, the, the lead professor. And he said, "Look, like fil- filmmaking is is a craft. Like to tell to tell a story is a craft. But like you know, to to really break some ground in that craft, you need to have an interest in something. And so part of that part of the uh, the major at the time." was to actually get a certain number of credits in some other body of study. And the professor was very much like, what are you interested in? You know, some, someday if, if things play out the way you think you'll play out, you're going to be a filmmaker about something mm-hmm. and, you'll be about, and you'll follow your interest. So what is that interest? And go out and study what that is. And so I ended up taking, you know, this is, this is Cornell University. I ended up taking like classes in, in, uh, in business law, in economics, in biology, because those were just all things I just had a natural interest in. Um, and it resulted in not just uh, developing a craft of filmmaking, but just an interest in the world and, and developing a way of, of uh, learning and following your interests um, to build a body of knowledge. So, so that was Cornell. Mm-hmm. After Cornell, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll do what everyone else does. I'm going to go to either New York or California and like work in the film industry. And through um, a friend's contact, we ended up, I ended up going to New York and working as a production assistant on commercials and industrials. Um, uh, I remember working on Chef Boyardee ravioli commercials. The only woman in a house full of men, and they're all hungry. Thank goodness for Chef Boyardee. I remember working on uh, promotions for uh, promos for Comedy Central, um, things like that. Just a lot of fun. Very, very interesting. But um, I don't know how much your your listeners know about what a production assistant does, but I, I was driving a truck. I was like, I was loading props into, you know, a truck. I was uh, laying out all the napkins and forks for the crew to eat, you know, because they were going to go on break. I was sweeping the floor where, on set to make sure that it, it looked as clean as it was when we got there. So like very little, uh, I had very little to do with the actual creative process of filmmaking at all at that level and got quickly pretty disillusioned with the whole uh, process um, and the lifestyle of trying to find jobs every couple of weeks. Um, and really, you know, that was around uh, 1999. And uh, what was going on in the world at that time was the internet bubble. The new economy. Is it a boom without end? It's first year economics at New York University, and Professor Mark Lieberman is talking Wall Street. Uh, But the question is, how long can Amazon.com's revenues continue to grow? Then there's no stopping today's stock market, even at today's presumably lofty levels. But if we're in in an economy where the old rules come into play from time to time, then much of what has happened in the 1990s will ultimately be challenged. Um, the internet started to get really big. YouTube hadn't even been created yet, but people were saying, you know, one day when bandwidth is is big enough, uh, people will watch videos on their computer. And everyone's like, whoa, like, can you imagine that world? And, you know, as a, as a, uh, a film grad, you're like, wow, that's incredible. Like, you could really just make stuff and people could watch it, like, on, you know, your laptop. You wouldn't have to, like, you wouldn't have to aspire and get to the point where, your stuff is so good that they put it on TV or in the movie theater, um, and so that 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 fascinated me. Uh, and the, the the power of the internet and and of of uh, uh, multimedia and computers, content creation on computers was fascinating to me. And 
I literally went to to Barnes and Noble and bought HTML for Dummies, and <laughs> I I read that cover to cover. I mean, I literally read that book cover to cover. Like, what does a bold tag do? Like, what does an italics tag do? Like, what is it? How do you create a table uh, you know, on a web page? Like, I just I read that entire thing, and started to you know to play with with uh, HTML and making web pages, um, with the idea that someday you know I needed to be ready to have my own website and, and get into this video stuff. And it was largely through that that I found my first job in 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 the uh, the web design industry as it was booming, you know, as as it was starting to grow. Mark then went on to work in web design for financial companies like the Knight Capital Group in the wake of the internet bubble, when the internet and related jobs were exploding and being incorporated into the businesses. Starting off just updating the corporate website every time that there was you know a press release, um, and then I started to to get to know the bunch of engineers that were working on electronic trading systems. And I had, because I had my background in film, um, I was just more of a visual guy and kind of got sucked into the, the area of discipline where they're like, well, how do we, how do we display such huge amounts of information in a, you know, in a way that's easy to digest? So after working there a couple of years, I, I ended up being, before they even had the term, what we look back as like a UX or a UI uh, or information designer. Um, yeah having a background in just figuring out what is the best way to display data and then technically how to get, you know, build a graphical interface for, for people to look at. Um, and uh, from there, it was just really interesting. Like I, I was beginning to look for a change at that point. Like I'd spent five years working, four or five years working in finance and um, was beginning to feel personally that like maybe I wanted to do something a little bit more creative. You know, I'd kind of like swore off film for a little while. Um, and again, I had a headhunter reach out to me that just said, hey, like you have a very interesting background of multimedia and film, as well as um, web engineering skills that are in high demand. I have a big client that uh, I think you would be interested in, in, in meeting with and, and working for um, if you're interested. And I said, well, that's, you know, it sounds all very interesting. Like, what is, what is the name of the company? And she's like, I can't tell you. And I was like, well, what, do you, what do you mean you can't tell me? She's like, I can't tell, I cannot, I don't want any, any other headhunter to know that I have this lead. So I don't want, you know, if you're interested, I'll t go to this, you know, this general vicinity at a certain time with your resume. Um, and fi 15 minutes before the interview, I'll tell you exactly what office to go to. And so I'm like, oh, well, this sounds like really intriguing. You know, I don't know what this company is and I don't know whether I want to work for them, but like just that setup was intriguing enough. Like, I, I got to try this just to tell a story you know, over beers to my friends. So they're like, go to Times Square at like, you know, noon. Um, and, you know, 15 minutes before your interview, I'm going to give you a call and tell you where to go. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll do that. And I'm like, well, how do I, you know, how do I write a cover? Like, what should I put on my resume? And they're like, they're like you know, it, it looks pretty good the way it is. Just emphasize your, your engineering skills, your uh, multimedia skills, and your film background. And that'll be enough. So I said, great, okay. So I'm waiting there. I remember waiting there in a coffee shop and I get the call from my headhunter and she's like, uh, you're interviewing at MTV and Nickelodeon today. And I was like, oh my God, I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. Um, and so I go up there and, and I interviewed with, uh, this, this, uh, with both groups, the MTV group and the Nickelodeon group. Um, at the time, I, di I didn't have kids. And in my head, I was like, MTV is cooler. Like, I want to work for MTV. I don't want to work for a kids network. Um, and, uh, the interviews went great with the two different groups. Um, MTV offered me a position and Nickelodeon, bo they both offered me positions and I was like all the way MTV. Um, and they're like, oh, but you know what? We're growing so fast. We don't have space for you. So like this position is probably going to open up in a month. Um, we literally just don't have a place for you to sit. And I was like, oh, a month. And then Nickelodeon's like, we've got space. We could take you now, you know, whenever you're ready. And I was like, I just can't let this go. Like, who knows what's going to happen in a month, whether they change their mind. So I was like, all right, fine, it's Nickelodeon. And, and you know, that, that was my start there. Can you tell me about your time there and like what you did and what you learned from that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I would start by, by saying that like, hands down, I spent 13 years there. Um, uh, and it's been about um, 11 months since I've, I've left the company. So I've gotten some time to, to, to reflect and look back at it. And... Um, I had just had such a, a wonderfully positive experience there. And in 13 years, I felt like the personal growth, the relationships I met, uh, the things that I was able to accomplish um, career-wise and creatively have just been absolutely fantastic. So I just have like 
the absolute fondest memories and uh, the deepest sense of gratitude that I was able to have that experience there. I started off there as an engineer, a web engineer, um, and started working with the different disciplines there that are all involved in the web engine. You work with producers, with writers, with editors, uh, with graphic artists, as well as all the, everybody on the business side. Um, and the way I the way I look at my career is I started off as the, the doer, the guy that actually would would uh, take everybody's blueprints, take everybody's graphics, and I would assemble all of that to create the website. Um, from there, as a web engineer, I moved over to what we call the product side, which is um, kind of a, assembling what the what the actual features are going to be on the website. Like, what is what is the function of the website? What are the tools? Uh, that you want to build as a part of knowing your audience and knowing what will actually best impact the growth or success of your website. I mean, that's how I'd kind of in, define product development um, in a nutshell and spent a, a vast number of years doing that. Uh, moved around in a couple of different areas. Um, I ran the uh, Nickelodeon Casual Games uh, product group for a while, which is a lot of the, uh, the web-based games that Nickelodeon put out. I uh, worked with game, game developers there. Uh, had a great time, met great people, um, and then was eventually tapped to to run uh, this stealth project with event that eventually became Noggin, which is uh, Nickelodeon's subscription service, kind of like Netflix. Have you heard? There's a whole lot happening on Nickelodeon. It's made for Noggin by Nick Jr. So, how has this shaped you as a person? Well, like during that thirteen years, how did that shape as a person? And what kind of work did you like um, do that was memorable for you? Okay, so there's probably a couple of different facets, but I think that like one, it's worth mentioning, especially the. Um, uh, I think it's worth mentioning that as an Asian with an, an Asian American upbringing, uh, and just where I was as as a person growing up in my mid twenties. I felt originally much more comfortable in in as a web engineer because, um, in a way, your output and how you did your job, uh, there was a certain level of objectivity to it. You know, almost just like taking a, a, a like taking a written test. Like, well, I got like ninety eight percent correct. Like, obviously, like at the end of the day, you could point to your code and be like, "Does my code do what you want wanted it to do?" Yes, and then there's a level of security in that. Like, I did my job well. You know. What what I saw, what when I look back at, at just how my career progressed, it was a process of gaining a more and more increasingly amount of self confidence in the stuff that is much more subjective, which is creative, right? Whether it's creative is purely subjective, but there's areas in, the, in between, like product management, where you analyze some data, but at the end of the day, there's also this creative component, uh, a gut component of like, well, you know what? Of all the five, fe- of all the the fifteen features that we're all discussing here, like. Uh, I feel like we should go with this particular feature. And sure, there's science behind it. You're like, you know, it tested well with users. It's something that uh, we see our competitors doing. But there's there's still this component of like of your success that is uh, subjective. Um, and um, as I look back at my own personal growth, I kind of see that those things were mirroring. I got more and more confident with myself in subjective things that are a little bit more subjective. Um, and, uh, that happened to be, to go in parallel with, with, you know, the career path that I took. One of the pivotal moments in his Nick career was tapped to run the product development group at Nick Clothing Games and how that was after these words from our sponsors. the Owen Tong down. Let's roll.
Welcome back to Stories for You and my conversation with Mark Chang. When we left off, Mark was tapped to run the product development group at Nickelodeon Games, a role aligned with his gaming interests and technical skills that helped him propel to a bigger role within the company. I'm curious what you think, con- what you consider to be a great game. What makes a good game out of it? Oh, let's see. I mean, t- t- to be clear, uh, as the guy running the the Nickelodeon Games product development group, um, I my team was not involved in actually uh, designing the games. So I, I just want to make that clear because that that is a fantastic group. A lot of them are still there, um, and I have uh, a lot of respect for for the work they do. Um, but to kind of get to, to the heart of your question about what makes a good game, especially for the, for the kids that we were focused on, I think that um, what you look for is um, games should be a safe place to fail. I think that to me that is a core component for a successful game, especially for young children. You know, there's a lot of pressures in the real world to actually do well in sports and in school and in grades and all that. And, and to me, like what I find a compelling game to be is, is, is first and foremost, what it, it, it's got to be, uh, you've got to feel safe to actually fail in, in one of those games. That is one area of, of, of Nickelodeon that I love the most, the amount of attention and time we spent doing research with kids um, was always just so much fun. From the philosophy of creating these games, right? Um... How did that reflect? Like, how did you apply that to your own, own like personal life? Because you talk about a lot about learning about your failures, and how did you, how were you able to learn and apply it to like what you do? I guess like throughout your jobs or your choices during that time. That's a pretty interesting question. I hadn't thought of it that way, but um, that's a really interesting question. Like if you if you take what I just said about a game and about um, feeling a person needing to feel safe or that it's okay to fail um and as well as making sure that it is fun i think there's a case you can make to say if you look at life the right way if you look at life kind of as this game um then maybe it would uh behoove you to look at failures as uh not so tragic right and to look at your adventures as um in a way that you can try to derive as much fun as possible through that. You know, if you take yourself less seriously or or not too harshly, at least, um, maybe your adventures in life uh, may actually be, um, you know, you, you treat your failures as learning experiences and you try to look for the, the humor and everything. Uh, and maybe we've stumbled upon something because I, th- I feel like when I look back, I, I've tried to do both, you know. I've obviously, obviously had failures that I've been hung up about, that I've been unhappy about, but, um, uh, you know, it, it's a healthy attitude to be like, oh, well, what, what did I learn? Or was it really that bad? And, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm not that I'm, uh, super, super old now. I'm about to I'm about hit 44 in a month. Um, but I, I definitely feel like I'm at an age right now, um, in life and career with my family, with my wife, with my relationships and adventures that like, you know, you feel you have this f- hyper hyper aware feeling of the of the human experience and just wanting to live uh, an enriching, fulfilling life uh, before your time runs out, before before the health runs out on your game, <laughs> if you want to use that uh, metaphor. Having worked at the same company, right? Um, huh? we, I mean, different groups because I was an international and you were in Nickelodeon. Like I had my fair share of like struggles, like you know, working there and learning about especially because it was my first job out there. So just learning about corporate culture, how does corporate America work? It was a good one-on-one lesson for me. And so I was wondering if you faced any like roadblocks during your time there. Sure. I mean, I feel like I absolutely felt, uh, I, th- I feel like everybody does. Um, my roadblocks, I think I would categorize them into a couple of different ways. Sometimes it's people, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the path to, to, uh, towards, um, promoting, getting promoted in your career. Sometimes it's a function of like, well, who, who's in front of you or what personalities do you have to work with? Um, so sometimes it's personalities. Um, I think sometimes it's yourself. Sometimes it's, um, you know, what are your hangups? Uh, what are, you know, what are your insecurities? Um, I feel like more often when, when I look back, it was more my my own insecurities or confidence issues than it was people. But no doubt, no doubt that it's people as well. You know, 
I remember this one pivotal experience that I had was um, we were all really working the team, this team of like fantastically brilliant people. We were all working against a time crunch uh, and needed to release a product at a a certain deadline. And for Nickelodeon, at least for that project, you know, the the deadline means because there's going to be on air commercials, there's going to be press about it. Like this is not something you you can really miss. Like failure is not an option. You just have to release it, you know. And um, being a big company there and, and working on these the projects that are this large, there's so many moving pieces. So everybody is just trying to hit their mark. Everybody is trying to get their thing ready just so you can be launch ready. And this was a moment where we were all scheduled to release something at like three o'clock. I'm making up the time. It's something like three o'clock. We all gather around and it's literally like, are we going to push this button or not that is going to push this thing out live? And uh, we go around and do last checks. Did you do your thing? Did you do your thing? Did you do your thing? Um, and one guy hadn't taken care of the thing that he was, you know, responsible for. And I don't even remember what the detail was either. Um, and just dealing with all that pressure of being the guy running the whole thing, I remember just losing my temper and being like, why? Like, why? Like, why didn't we get it done? And it just turned out being a very difficult and unfortunate moment that like I let negative emotions get in the way. Um, whereas the alternate, the alternate could have been, all right, we, th- we just need that one thing done. Like, I believe we can do this, you guys. I believe that this is the moment that every single one of us is going to pull through. And how do we help get that thing done? But instead, my reaction was like, w- why didn't you get it done in time? You know, and to, to me, to me, I look back at, as, at that as a defining moment in my right. own growth as, as a leader and as a person. Um, because you look back in an event like that and you're like, well, what type of person do I want to be? Or what type of person do I want people to remember me as being at that point? And I look back and constantly wish I had done it differently because for all those people in the room, for all those people in the conference call, and for the one person who, you know, uh, who was affected most by it, I could I could have been a totally different guy. I could have been the leader that says, we're going to do it. And people will tell stories and look back and be like, that was a great release because of all that, you know? But instead it was like, ah, that went, that was really, really ugly. And so when you ask what some of the, you know, the pitfalls were, the obstacles were like, you know, sometimes it's yourself. During that time, like, how did you balance making that feature while being an executive and not only the biggest corporation, but at that point you had a family with three children. So how did you uh, balance all of that at the same time? Look, man, there's no, uh, there's no secret time machine there. It's just, uh, it's just figuring out if, if it's important to you, you figure out how to get it done. That, like, that's one. The, the second thing is that, uh, you know, you, I look back and I, I've never looked at like uh, my family life or my personal life as uh, in being in direct competition with any of my career aspirations, you know. Um, I, I attribute a lot of that to um, my wife and the way that she uh, just pushes me to be the best version of myself and to pursue the, pursue the things that fulfill me. She's like, go figure it out. Like, it's, it's just planning. Like, figure out how to do it. So I have, I have three kids, uh, 11, 9, and 7. Uh, my wife and I adopted all three of, of, the, of our children. Um, and we arrived at adoption Uh, and built our family after uh, struggling with infertility for five years. And when I look back, you know, the the five years were spent, like, you know, we wanted to, in in our heads at the time, it was conceiving biologically was really the the only thing, the only option for us in building a family or the, that we thought. And so it wasn't until much later that when we arrived at the, as of the idea of adoption and family building, that we embraced it. And we never looked back. Um, They're they're amazing kids. And it was the best decision I've ever made in my personal life. Um, but because of that, you know, I look back at these five years spent of trying to start a family in, in the way that we only knew, like, that was the only option for us because that's all we really thought of, right? I look at those five years as like, man, like, you know, in one way, everything happens for a reason, so I don't question it. But what I do kind of, what I have drawn from that experience, though, is this feeling that like, time is so fleeting, right? Like time goes by so quickly in the blink of an eye. Some of that is just from general parenthood, but also just how the ex- my experience is leading up to creating a family. And like that has never left me, the feeling of like how precious time is. And if it is that precious, you know, what are you going to do about the time you have available to you? How are you going to spend that? 
And how much of it are you going to spend trying to do something or sitting around wishing you could do something? And 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 it's almost so personal and so to my core that it never even came up incidentally when you and I were speaking before. Um, but I feel like that has been a core driver just in like my outlook at this point. Like to a lot of people, 44 is young. Sometimes do you think 44 is old? Like sometimes I look at it like, I'm going to die of old age soon. Like I better hurry up and live more, as much life as possible, right? But like, I think to me, to me that has been, uh, that experience has been so powerful um, that sometimes I don't even recognize uh, the force it has on me, but it is, it affects how I look at time and how I want to spend my time and how I look to spend my time. So you were a VP uh, slash GM and Nick, how did you like get back into making movies and eventually meeting Larry Hama, which, which is basically meeting your idol at the time? Yeah. So, I mean, I would almost, I would start the six months before getting the Nickelodeon job, um, maybe eight months. Um, I was at a point where I was working for a finance company. I was in the process of getting my MBA uh, in finance. And mm -hmm. I had largely been looking at content creation, filmmaking and stuff like that as something I used to be interested in as a kid. You know, just like, oh, that was, mm -hmm. that was the pipe dream. Like now it's grown up, like we grown ups, Wall Street guys, like this is what we seriously do. You know, we get our MBAs and stuff. Um, and uh, I remember just like watching this documentary that I stumbled upon. I think it was called American Movie. Going out in the woods. I had my shopping to do. Okay, you got to spread apart that way. All of the extras have just fell through, except for Mike Shank right there. We used to uh, do a lot of partying together, but I don't party anymore. <laughs> and it was such a, an interesting turn of events or a coincidence because I was just about to turn 30. And this documentary was about a 30 year old guy named Mark, who all he wanted to do in his life was to make this one movie. And uh, it documented all the different things he was trying to do to get it done. And uh, in some cases highlighted his own level of incompetence or and his friends around him either doubting him or just truly believing in him. And it was such a pivotal um, and uh, uh, powerful experience for me to watch this movie. And I'm like, this guy's named Mark too. He's like the same age as me and his name is Mark. And I'm returning to my wife and just saying like, you know, like I really want to make a film now. I think I really want to. And she's like, okay, okay then, then do it. And I remember like I, I wrote a screenplay for like a short film um, in my last year in business school. And I said, once I graduate, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to direct this film myself. Um, and uh, I remember it was a science fiction movie with all these guns and SWAT team people running around. And I had no idea how to get this, get any of these props. And I just went on the internet and, and searched for a prop house in the city. And I found this, this uh, company called The Weapon Specialists and went to their website and they had like, they had like guns on their website, prop guns, you know? And I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, these are the guys, like, I'm going to rent all this equipment. So I called them up and I was like, hey, I saw your website. Like, I, you know, you've got like machine guns for like, for movies. Like I'm making a film and they're like, I'm like, but you know, do you have like this type of gun? Like, and the guy was just like, he's like, don't look at our website. Our website's ancient. Just please, you just have to come in and see what we have. Like, do not look at our website. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. oh, really? And they're like, yeah, our website is, is so outdated. We have so much more. We need to fix it. And so I was like, oh, okay. And I, and I went in and they had a ton of, of great stuff. Um, and then I looked at their, their rates and I'm like, I cannot afford any of this. Like, that, it all looks so great, but I couldn't afford any of it. And so that, that's where I got this idea. And I said, hey, you know what, guys? Like, I'm a web developer and you guys have gun props that I need. So what would you think about bartering? Like, what if, you know, you said your website's out of date. What if I just updated your website for you? Do you think you could give me a discount or we could barter? And they're like, yes. They're like, you build us, you update our website, and in return, you can come in whenever you want, and anything, any idle inventory that we have that has not been rented, you can just borrow for the weekend and, sh and film with it. And I was like, deal. So that was how, you know, my first film in like four years, I was actually created because I was able to barter my own web development skills um, with the weapon specialist, and in return, I got these fantastic looking you know, replica guns for my movie. So like I said, that was, uh, keep in mind, that was like six or seven months before I got my Nickelodeon job. Through, so throughout my time at Nickelodeon, for those 13 years, I kept in touch with the founder of that company. And every so often I'd be like, 
oh, what, you got like a new feature, you got a new website, you got, you know, you need a new website, you need new features, like, I'll be there and do it. And I would just work on the weekends and nights for them. And then every like, you know, usually it was a tradition, every summer, I would make a short film. Um, because at Nickelodeon and in the media, like you get you get summer Fridays, you get like every other Friday off, you know. And so I'm like, I'm gonna I'm gonna spend that summer Friday shooting a shooting a film, and I'm gonna go to the weapon specials and check out whatever they have, and we're just gonna have like all this gear, you know, and get ahead of everybody else because I didn't I still didn't have that much money to spend. So so the the point is that like for for 13 years I kept this relationship with the specialists. They ultimately changed their company name. I helped them like rebrand themselves, add new features. Um, they started growing and getting into other areas instead of just weapons rentals. They prop fabrication, uh, prosthetics, you know, all this other cool stuff that they were, they had industrial 3D printers. Um, and I kept making these short films. And eventually, for the last five years of my time at Nickelodeon, I was like, you know what? I'm ready to do, I'm going to do a feature film now. I'm doing full length. Forget about 20 minute films. We're doing a ninety, a full ninety-minute like sci-fi epic movie with all these like special effects and guns and SWAT team soldiers and stuff, and I'm gonna use you know use my relationship with the specialists and and, and get it all done. Um, and it took five years to finish. Um, we can talk about where that film went, you know, in a bit. But like basically, as I reached this point in my career at Nickelodeon where I was looking for a change, um, it just so happened that the the founder of the weapon specialist that had renamed themselves the specialists had grown to the point where they were doing um, feature length films and and working on special effects for Netflix shows like you know like um, Daredevil and The Punisher like all this great stuff that you and I probably watch um, and they're like hey you know what like we we need a creative director I think uh, it's time for you to just come on full time and i remember thinking like no no like i'm i'm a nickelodeon guy like i'm you know i'm running this this business unit here um and have a lot of still have a lot of stuff to do and he's like well just you know just come like you haven't been to our facility in a little while i want to show you everything we're doing um and uh a whole bunch of things kind of just fell in place and uh, i ended up uh leaving nickelodeon to work for these guys and join them as a business partner and so you know, I, I look back at the the all these events that happened in my life, and and this relationship with this company was 13 years in the making, um, and so I felt like this was just a fantastic, unique opportunity that I had to just try, almost just had to try, just to say I could, to say that I did it. So um, after more than a couple of years of being a Nickelodeon, um, I was looking for another short film project to work on. Um, and this was around the time where, like, there were a, a, a lot of uh, large technology uh, enhancements in cameras at the time. These small little consumer-level cameras were beginning to turn out some really good cinematic footage, you know, by its ability to do critical focus and stuff like that. And I was like, I need to make a short film. I need to make a short film using all this new equipment. I want to learn Final Cut Pro finally. Like, I'm going to think of a project that I can do that. Um, but I want to make it worthwhile. And so I'm like, you know what? I haven't done a fan film in a while. Like, a fan, you know, fan films for viewers who don't know, are like, you know, people that are simply fans of a franchise like He-Man or G.I. Joe or Transformers or, you know, Marvel superheroes will just pick up a camera, make their own costumes and make their own versions of the film. So it's a fan created film, fan films. So I was like, I want to do that. And the appeal to me was that um, when you do a fan film, you have a built in audience. So you know, instead of creating my own superhero, I would do something that everybody knows. And that way, when I put it on YouTube, uh, I'll at least come on, like, at least get like a couple thousand views out of it because everyone wants to see what this guy's done for that particular franchise. And so I was like, well, what what has, hasn't really been done yet? There have been so many Star Wars fan films out there, a lot of Marvel stuff out there. And I was like, well, what in my childhood really resonates with me? And I was like, you know what? Like, I want to do G.I. Joe. I like the G.I. Joe song, like the G.I. Joe characters, you know, I had my in with the specialists and they had all these guns and I'm like, I can do this. And so I'm like, all right, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing a G.I. Joe fan film. Um, and I ended up uh, uh, making a, a short film uh, with a whole bunch of G.I. Joe characters. I even tapped into the cosplay community and, and cast a couple uh, uh, well-known G.I. Joe cosplayers. Um, because frankly, like, cosplayers will spend more money on their costume than like I could ever afford to, to, to budget. So like you get these cosplayers that have like, you know, put so much into the detail of their costume. Like, come on, you gotta be in my film. And so um, I released this G.I. Joe fan film on Facebook and on the internet and people were like enjoying it. And I was, actually, I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I'm getting like fan mail of like from G.I. Joe fans. And this one G.I. Joe fan was like, 
you need to show this to Larry Hama. And I'm like, at the time, I'm like, who's, I'm like, Larry who? Like, who's Larry Hama? And they're like, hello, like, are you an idiot? Like, you know, Larry Hama, like, editor, like, editor of, of uh, Marvel Comics, like, the guy who created the G.I. Joe franchise, like, hello? Go open, like, you know, issue 12 of your comic books, like, and I was like, oh, really? And I went back to, like, look at my comic books, and, like, Larry's name is in every single, is credited in every single G.I. Joe comic. And, and so what I became to realize, learn to realize is that um, uh, he was the guy at Marvel Comics who was tasked with creating um, a comic book storyline for the Hasbro toy franchise of G.I. Joe. So literally everything that I knew about G.I. Joe and enjoyed about him as a kid was because of Larry. Larry's a Japanese American who served in mm-hmm. Vietnam, brought a lot of his, you know his military know-how um, to give some integrity to those stories, and just created fantastically vivid characters. A lot of them were based on his friends, and so I found Larry on Facebook and said, "Hey, like, I don't, you know, you don't know me at all, but I know your work, and I'm a huge fan, and I, I just wanted to s- share with you this fan film I made for whatever it's worth." Um, and hope you like it because the stuff that you that you created was really influential in my life. And Larry wrote back to me and be like, "This is really cool." And like, call me sometime. And I'm like, "Oh my god!" Like Larry, I'm going to call him. Um, and so like, uh, I remember calling him while I was waiting for the train to go home in Manhattan. And mm-hmm. he's like, "I live in Wall Street. Like, we should get together sometime and have lunch." And I'm like, "Oh my god! Like, yes, we're going to have lunch." Um, and so I'm like, <laughs> told my friends, like, I'm having lunch with like the Larry Ham. I like, can't believe it. And I went down to meet him and he's just the coolest freaking guy. We just spent like hours talking about our favorite movies. Like, that's all it was. He's like, did you see aliens? And I'm like, oh my God, I love mm-hmm. aliens. Like, did you, and like, did you watch hard boiled that Hong Kong flick? And he's like, oh my God, I love that too. And he's like, how did you make this fan film anyway? And I'm like, well, like I, I bought this camera and I did it. And he's like, that's, she's like, that's the way to do it. Like, that's the way to do it. And uh, things just went so well at the end. I was just like, hey, like, you know, it's really nice meeting you. And I'm like, maybe we should make a film together sometime. I'd love to do something with you. And he's like, he's like, yeah, but you know what you got to do? And I'm like, what? And he's like, we're not, no more fan films. We need to create original IP, original intellectual property. And I was like, yeah, like, I'm down with that. And this, I'm just saying yes, no matter what he says at this point, because it's just Larry Hama. And I was like, well, I've got a couple of like story ideas, you know, I could kick around and you send me some of your ideas. And we, we, we picked this science fiction screenplay I had written like four years ago. And he's like, I like this. Like, we could do something with this. Um, and that was the, the beginning of, of the film Ghost Source Zero. That was the, the feature film that, that took five years to make. Um, Larry and I worked on it together with another uh, creative partner of mine. Sorry, with another creative partner of mine, Joe uh, Barbagallo. And um, it took five years to complete. And um, last summer, I believe in June, uh, Sony Pictures Home Entertainment picked up the film and r- released it in the U.S. for us on iTunes. And so that was like, you know, that was f- absolute fantastic closure to like one of the most amazing parts of my professional career, which was, you know, making a G.I. Joe fan film, meeting its creator, creating another sci-fi script with him taking five years to make it while i'm you know hustling at nickelodeon spending years and hours endless hours on the train doing all of the editing and visual effects um and for it to be picked up by sony was just a fantastic you know i never never dreamt for it to go that far but um you know maybe it's a testament to how far you can go if you really just go for it the bottom line is that there is no time machine. It's how you spend your time. And so when I talk to young guys or or people that want to do it too, and they're like, "Oh, how did you do it?" And I'm like, "Look, this is this is what it's going to be. Uh, at five o'clock, everyone's going to leave the office, um, and a whole bunch of your friends are all going to go to the bar and clubbing tonight because it's Thursday night, and they're going to ask you to come, and you're going to say, "No, you know why? Because I want to go home and work on my screenplay, or no, no, I'm running to a rehearsal right now because I'm meeting two actors, and 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 that's the choice." You know, I didn't get to go see the movie in the theater and I didn't get to binge the series until five months later because I was spending my time doing something else, right? And sometimes you can be proud of that. And sometimes you're like, you know what? I kind of miss out on that. Like, oh, it looks like you guys had a lot of fun that night. Like, man, like, what was I doing? And and hopefully if you made the right choices, you're, you're, you, will, you will regret, you will have less feelings of regret and more like that is that is that was good time spent. But, but mm-hmm. and, and to put it in perspective, like, when I say I spent five, five years making that film, 
there were periods of time in the making of that film that I would spend 40, you know, 45 hours uh, in the office on my day job and 30, 35 hours of that same week was spent making a film. You know, I would spend an hour going to work and an hour coming back on a train, right? So that's 10 hours a week, 10 hours on my laptop doing visual effects, right? So that's 10 hours. Come home, be a dad, talk to the wife, put the kids to sleep, do another two hours before I turn in for the night, right? So that's another, that's another uh, 10 hours right there during the week. So now I'm up to 20, right? Weekend, yeah, tons of stuff to do. Go to Taekwondo, do grocery shopping, date night, all that stuff. Every wife goes to sleep, spend another six hours in front of the computer doing some more visual effects, right? So now we're up to like, I don't even know how many hours we're up to. You, you keep adding that up and it, it's, not un, it's not unlike what other people do. I mean, you, you look around us, there are people that are doing two, three jobs, you know, a, a week just to get by. And, and, and you and I are privileged enough that we don't need to do two to three jobs and work a hundred hours just to get by. But I'll find that other time for my side hustle because that's what I really want to do. You know, yeah. And so it's kind of like what I, I think it's like Will Smith or some of the other you know these guys that are inspirational. You you just outwork people. You're like, no way. Like I'm going to log. You know, when they log five hours, I'm going to log twenty hours. You know, and obviously there's a whole bunch of other components there. Like you have to have the time. You have to um, you have to have the tools. You have to have the skills. You have to be able to learn uh, and teach yourself. Sure, those are all important components. But like. Make no mistake, like there, there's no substitute for the time you want to put in and how you choose your time. What makes you so much in love about this whole filmmaking process? Because I, I do like content creation, but I wanted to hear from your side on what makes it so lovable for you. Yeah, sure. So like um, you're reminding me of like when I, I occasionally apply to like these director fellowships and these programs, right? And, and a lot of the, the essay assignments are like, why do you want to become a director? And you just kind of like initially just sit there and stare at the screen because you're like, I don't know why, you know, I have no idea why. And, and what it really comes down to sometimes is that it is such a deeply ingrained part of what drives you that it's actually hard to articulate. Um, mm -hmm. But having spent some time or, you know, an, enough time writing these applications, I think what I've arrived at is that like what I enjoy so much about uh, creating content or, or writing or, you know, playing, directing is that um, it ultimately comes down to shaping experiences and um it's on so many different levels that are, that are interesting to me that like on on one level you're shaping the experience of the audience the the viewer the viewer wants an experience that, w that was worth his time his or her time right if it's five if it's a five minute short you want to create a five minute experience that you're like yeah that was worth five minutes of my time right no one no the death is when they're like that was like, I would never get that time back in my life. Like, please kill me now. Like, you know, that's two, that's two hours of my time. I'll never get back. Like that's, that's, that's painful. But like, um, and so that's one part of it to give the viewer an experience that was worthwhile to them and worthwhile could be, it was funny. It was enriching. It was just whatever, whatever is important to them that they feel it was worthwhile. The other plane there though, is that, uh, it's the experience filmmaking is a hugely social experience, right? You need to much yeah. like my work at Nickelodeon. You are working with um, uh, passionate artists, craftsmen, technicians, engineers, and project managers, and money people, right? And mm -hmm. and you and you know for certain projects you will work with hundreds of, of of people like that. And at least for me, not everyone's like this. I know not everyone's like this, but for me, it is what is their experience on set? You know, if they're going to spend you know on the worst the worst of shoots, you're going to spend. 18 hours a day together on a set, like at least my philosophy is like, I, I, I think about their experiences as well because I personally feel, and, and my, my life experiences has at least reinforced my belief that like, if you give, especially if you give any of these people positive experiences that they will do better and perform better, you know, an artist for sure, you, you create a, a wholesome creative en environment for them. They will perform better and deliver better. Same with everybody else. Even if the movie didn't do well or no one really liked it, if if you conduct at least for myself, it, if you conduct yourself with that approach, at least you had a fantastic time with twenty five people on set for that one day, you know. Um, and so I lo I look look at things like like uh, content creation as um, 
shaping and creating positive and worthwhile experiences for everybody involved. That's the viewer as well as all the creators. Every so often, you know, as you're trying to get this project out and you're trying to get this project to be the best version of itself, or you're trying to make this idea the best version of its idea, and you're trying to make this brand the best version of what it stands for, you know, al along the way, like, I think the, the relationships you have and the experiences you have with other people um, become that thing that keeps you going. That's the way I look at it. Mark's future plans include hitting more career milestones, such as becoming a second unit director focused on action scenes and visual effects, and also broader goals such as honing his craft as an individual creator. And so I've been working with other writers. I've directed about four different uh, short films since I left Nickelodeon, um, working on some others, and, uh, you know, we'll see where, where life takes me. Since you made that you know leap of faith and jump, do you have any advice for others hoping to transfer from, let's say, one industry to another or thinking of making that big change and pursuing that passion? Sure. You know, I think that like it's it's at least three parts. You know, you have to be when an opportunity presents itself, you have to be um, Confident enough that you're like, I can do this. Like, I want to do this. It's worth the risk, all the risks I'm taking, right? I think that's one of it. Um, it is, you know, before that opportunity even presents itself, investing in the skills that you want to have for that opportunity. You can't just sit around and be like, I wish somebody would offer me, you know, the opportunity to do blah, blah, blah. And, but I don't have the ability to do it. I just want the opportunity. Like, you know, you've got to like time it out, right? Like invest in yourself and invest in your skill set to get, uh, to be ready for that. Um, and, uh, you know, where are these opportunities going to come from? Like, are they just literally going to fall in your lap or are they going to come from people you've known for 13 years? Um, are they going to need to know you for 13 years before they even offer that opportunity to you? You know, I think I, to me, I look back at my relationship with the weapon specialist slash the specialist that started, uh, what feels like an eternity ago before I even started working at Nickelodeon. And who would have thought that like continuing to have a relationship with them for 13 years would somehow someday lead to an opportunity to become uh, their creative director and to create a joint venture with them to create original content, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'd say like, uh, it, it's hard. You, you know, what's really hard about that, about that question and how to give advice to somebody like that is that like, yeah. Um, yeah. The, the advice needs to be so custom tailored to the person you're talking to because everybody is in a slightly different boat. Everybody has different challenges, different personal challenges are in different situations. So for one guy can be like, look, you are ready right now. You just simply need the confidence to, to like let go and go into the next thing. That, that could be one guy. The other guy could be like, yo, you are way too confident. You need to be a little bit more uh, brutally honest with yourself and your capabilities before you go into that room and say, this is what I want, right? Or there's a person who I want, I want to be, you know? Um, and so it's, it's hard to boil it down to actionable advice that is uh, for everybody without it sounding just completely superficial and fortune cookie. But I, I think it's a combination, you know, the, the key ingredients are like, be brutally honest with yourself. Um, uh, learn what you need to learn. Ident know what you don't know is, is a huge thing. You know, a lot of people have no idea what they don't know, and it's it's really hard to work with them. Um, uh, but know what you don't know, and how do you do that? Like, how do you how do you find out what you don't know? Oh my God, you better meet somebody who knows more than you and talk to them, right? And so, sure, there's a social component, right? But like, if somebody's an extrovert, they're going to get very different advice from me than the introvert, right? And so, to me, those are just the the, the high level components that I think to be brutally honest with yourself. Um, because that's really going to help you identify uh, the, the, the things you need to work on. The other thing that is, to me, a key outlook in my life is that, like, everybody's strength is also their biggest challenge, right? And so what is a pathway to know, to knowing what you don't know is, is maybe, and being brutally honest with yourself is like, well, identify what you really think your strengths are, and then play out, like, how does, what, what is the weakness there then? Like, and, and if that's a blind spot to you, uh, explore that. Do some introspection, you know? My, my new thing now after, you know, I feel like I'm in a different phase of my career is not like uh, getting as much experience as possible, but, but getting as much reflected experience. Like you need to reflect on your, the experiences you've had. What have you learned from them? Um, 
because that will really help you make intelligent decisions about what to do next. You know, do you really need five years of experience of blank or do you actually need like six months of intense learning experience from that thing to actually extract all of the lessons? I just have one more question to ask him. It all comes down to because all your hero journey that it sounds like it's all about storytelling and what you're telling me is storytelling. And I was wondering why storytelling is so important to you and what kind of impact do you think it brings to different communities uh, today now that we need it? Ooh, another hugely lofty question, but like, you know, it goes down to like when you're a kid and you read like nursery rhymes or fables, right? And the story, you know, it's totally a spoon fed situation, but like that character learned never to lie or like, you know, the boy who cried wolf, like he told too many lies. And then what is the life lesson from that? Like, that's what stories are. Stories are the ability to, to extract an, an experience without having to actually go through it. Sometimes stories are a way to, to, to con- convey a message uh, uh, in, a, in a slightly subtle way when the explicit way um, is, is something that the, the, the listener doesn't want to hear. Um, and then, you know, what I would say is that um, I believe right now, uh, we because of the advances in technology, um, we are in a, our society is in a phase where we have information and data overload. The ability to take information, I mean, let's just say, what is, what is the, the, the broadest definition of a story is to take information, to link that information together so that it creates some level of uh, cohesiveness um, and conveys um, a, a series of ideas that somebody can find fulfilling, right? And um, I think mm-hmm. storytelling is so, yeah. so, so important now. By the last, the last phase of my career at Nickelodeon, I, you know, I started reading things about why, why CEOs and general managers need to be good storytellers. Like, why? Like, why would they? And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, like, I'm a, I'm a mini GM, a vice president of a business unit, and I'm a story, you know, and I'm a director. Like, I better know the answer to that. Let me go read that article, you know, and they're like, you know, you need to be able to convey a sense of purpose to everybody you work with. Like wherever you are in your career, whether you're, what, what is your sphere of influence? You might be the lowest guy uh, in, in a job organization, or you might be the head and have hundreds of direct reports, but through, you need to be able to, to justify and explain to people uh, what you're doing, why you're doing it, uh, where you're going, and what, why is it important? Like what positive effects does that have? And sometimes it's a story. Sometimes it's the story of, right. uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll end that with, with this, this particular story. Um, yeah. When I was working on Noggin, uh, like I said, Noggin is a subscription yeah. service for uh, young children, uh, children the, uh, under the age of seven. And uh, we were just trying to create the best experience for kids to be able to watch the shows they want on an iPad. Like it was, to me, it was simple as that. And we had... Um, uh, we had a mother write in and say that um, she was the mother of a child with uh, Down syndrome. And to hear her explain it, she said, um, my, my child is never going to grow up. He is, he is never going to become a grown-up. He is forever going to be a child. And the fact that you have created this, uh, this app, this service, with these shows on it, um, he is going to enjoy this for like the rest of his life. And it was an incredible moment for me because uh, up until then, um, I had kind of largely mapped out my philosophy as um, almost equally uh, passionate that your child only has one childhood. Look, your child only has one childhood. Like, as a parent, as a person, as a person who works for a kid's, a kid's brand, like make sure that, that that childhood is worthwhile. Make sure you don't mess it up. Like make sure that it's the most beautiful thing that they will ever have, right? That they can look back on and, and cherish. Um, and that's the level of responsibility that, that I felt and that I tried to convey to my teams, that they only have one childhood. And then here comes a mom that says, you know what, like my child, my, my son will have a childhood forever and this is the impact you're having on him and to me that that was incredible too that like wow where up until now i've been thinking like we've got you know seven eight ten twelve thirteen years to make sure our audience has a good time with us uh for this 
for this one mom, we have almost, you know, for as long as the company will exist or the service will exist, we have, uh, at least in her eyes, made sure that this boy's entire life will be taken care of and enriching because he can look forward to watching Noggin. You know, like, man, how incredible is that? So from that note, I was wondering, do you have like any new projects that you're working on now, whether it was with Larry or something else? Absolutely. So um, uh, with the specialists, um, I'm working on another uh, project with, with Larry. It's, uh, I, can sh- I can share that it's, it's another science fiction uh, action type of series, much in the same theme of, of the stuff that, that he and I really enjoy, like you know, not too distant future, androids becoming self-aware, like militarized, like police and androids running around, blowing each other up. Uh, a lot of really fun stuff. This one is kind of exciting because it would be, it's, it would, um, uh, would be serialized. So there's a couple different parts to it. Um, and I'm really excited because the specialists are a partner in that and it'll be the first co-production with them. So, And that was my conversation with content creator Mark Chang. If you want to learn more about his work, please check out the link below. I was talking to him from our office in New York and he was in a studio in LA and we had a studio producer to record his side of the conversation. Stories For You is hosted by me, Kazuki Akiba, and produced by me and Reed Yurman. Additional dialogue written by Tiffany Ku and Nicole Bernardo. Edited by me, John Ladinier and Nicole Bernardo. Kari Johnson and Grey Laptop mixed the episode and music by Grey Laptop. Special thanks to Kilohertz Productions for the studio recording in Space in LA. If you left a review, rating, or share the show with your friends, thank you. Keep doing it. And one final announcement. So if you remember the very first episode, I said there are only going to be 10 episodes and maybe some more if you all like it. Well, guess what? We're going to keep making them. People seem to like them and we like making them too. We're going to end the season now and we're going to be back in the fall with much more regular schedule and I'm very excited about that. So stay tuned and we will be back with more stories for you. Until then, thanks for listening.